So what happened after Matt was killed, it was just sort of like woke everybody up. I think that this was a thing. Oh, yeah. Tell us a little bit about what happened with Matthew and the organization that you founded, and then I'll just go from there. Okay, cool. So um, 25 years ago this year, um, in October 98, uh, my son, Matt, was murdered in an anti-gay hate crime outside Laramie, Wyoming. He was a University of Wyoming student um, who was befriended by two locals who pretended to be gay because they assumed, again, Matt was gay because he had nice clothes on and had to pay for beer with paper money. Um, so, uh, yeah, they set out to rob him so they could buy drugs and it turned into something much bigger. Um, they readily admitted um, in their uh, act of violence and beating Matt that the main young man doing it uh, was shouting gray epithets and um, they were both Matt's age. It was, you know, it was like, not just our family it was, was um, changed forever, but so were theirs. So it was just, it was mm -hmm. awful. Um, yeah. Anyway, it was all, it all came together. The, they found the two men, it was a trial within a year. They're both serving consecutive life sentences now. Um, they'll never get out unless a governor of Wyoming would commute one of the sentences, which would make yeah. them eligible for parole. I don't anticipate that happening in my lifetime. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so what happened after Matt was killed, it was just sort of like woke everybody up. I think that this was... A thing. Oh yeah, yes. And, uh, mainstream media paid attention to it, whereas before, mainstream media really only paid attention to um, pride parades and sequins or the uh, AIDS pandemic. Mm -hmm. And this obviously led you to become an advocate. It did. Um, all of us, actually. Mm -hmm. My husband Dennis and I and our younger son, while Matt was still in the hospital got so much mail from parents, especially asking us to use this time to say we were accepting parents and to encourage others to accept their children. Wow. Wow. They still had their kids. They still had their kids, right? So um, we figured as long as we would have a voice in the media that we would use that to try to remind people to love their kids. Was that a difficult decision for you to do yeah. in the midst of your own grief? No. no. No, it was, actually, it was, a, I, I don't know, this may sound weird when I say it, but it was a distraction. I, I needed something, right? Yeah. I needed a purpose. And my husband had to go back to work overseas, and my younger son had to go back to school. So it was just me, and I needed a purpose. So I was ready to take this on, and actually, that became my grieving process. Oh, that's amazing. Um, I do have questions about your journey, but if you don't mind talking about your relationship with Matt and his coming out and whether you knew he was gay prior to his coming out and how you handled that. Um, I had suspected that Matt was gay from about the age of eight or nine, and I don't know why. I just, mm -hmm. I just thought maybe something. Um, yep. He was definitely um, a unique child he was very empathetic more so than other children um could easily pick up on other people's feelings and was very concerned when it seemed like other people's feelings were hurt and um, i don't know if that played into it or not but it just it, there's just something and i had a lot of gay friends in college so you know i, I hate to say it was a stereotype but i don't know anyway um I mean, can I just add, can I comment on, sure. there was something in your intuition about being a mother to him that wasn't necessarily a stereotype. You were attuned to who he was and it was okay with you. Yeah, it was, it was absolutely fine with me. But I also knew Matt well enough to know that I could not approach him. He would have to tell me in his own time. Yes. I knew if I brought it up, he would retreat and it had to be something that when he was, if indeed he was gay, it would have to be in, in his own time. Was that hard for you? 
no, because I knew the alternative would be wrong. So mm-hmm. I just I just waited. In the meantime, though, I've had other people, young people especially. Well, they're probably not young people anymore. Um, not anymore. Right. Say to me, I wish someone would have started the conversation. My feeling about that is, you just got to know your kids, right? Yeah. It's, it's a mixed bag. Some kids do wish their parents would have asked. Many parents that I've spoken to out of respect have left it up to their kids and honored them by waiting. Yeah. So, so I just waited. And um, when, he, when he did come out, he was 18. Uh, we were living in Saudi. And he called me in the middle of the night, which Matt always did because time zone math was just like not going to do it. <laughs> and he said, Mom, I'm, I have to tell you something. I am gay. And my response was, what took you so long to tell me? Mm. And his yeah. was, I don't understand. How did you know before I knew? It's like, well, they tell me it's a mom thing. So, um, huh. And in this conversation, he asked me to not tell his dad because he wanted to do that in person. Everybody else got in person. I got the phone call. Um, <laughs> So, That's how it works. Yeah. And I, it was just not a big thing. And I knew it wouldn't be a big thing for Dennis either. But Dennis does have a tendency to say things without thinking about the consequences. And I didn't want him to say something out of ignorance mm-hmm. that would hurt Matt that he yeah. could never take back. Not, yeah. not in that moment. Yeah. Um, so I told Dennis and he was like, no, Matt's not gay. He just hasn't met the right girl. And I'm like, Dennis, all his friends are girls. um so but there was never any rejection from my family uh and when you say your family you mean the extended family as well or or the nuclear family well that's the deal okay nuclear family no extended Mm -hmm. family we're never really gonna gonna know because matt's not here anymore Ah. matt Matt didn't have time to tell everybody right so yeah. I told my mom it was fine with my mom. She, yeah. she didn't want to meet his boyfriend, but she was fine with Matt being gay. She just didn't want to meet anymore. Um, we just, I, I really think in all honesty that only time would tell if everyone would have been okay, but now they can just say whatever and it doesn't, doesn't really matter. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. We did lose friends, some friends, mostly because we continued to speak out. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had one friend try to save me um, that lasted about a heartbeat and um, <laughs> yeah that was pretty much it I, that was pretty much it okay I, again I appreciate the candidness and I'm struck by how emotional the topic is and I, you know, I can see it on your face 25 years later um, interesting. Some people were scared about attending tonight because it's such a painful topic. And yet you are an inspiration and you've done so much work for all of us. So I'm curious about how you straddle the line of grief and activism and the rewards that you receive as a result. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So my husband says I'm very good at compartmentalizing. That's a good um, thing. And I'm very much an introvert. This was not an easy call for me. Yeah. Because I really, I don't, I'm a true introvert. I kind of don't really like people. So uh, <laughs> no, no offense. Anybody out there? <laughs> All uh, uh, 75 people out there. Yeah. So, but I grew up in Wyoming. Like nobody lives here. So you just don't right. you grow up with, you know, nobody around and yeah. you learn how to be your own company. And I pretty much grew up an only child, even though I have, I have siblings, but they're much, much older. They were gone by the time I was, you know, in school. Mm -hmm. So I pretty much grew up an only child where your conversation is with yourself. And so this was kind of, but I was so driven by the fact that I had to do this for Matt. Mm -hmm. I owed it to him to try to make things better for his friends and his peers and even his brother. Mm -hmm. Um, Just because I thought it would make the world better. Yeah. I am one voice. I had no illusions that it was going to be a big thing. But I thought I owed it to Matt to try to do something while the media was still paying attention to us. Yeah, yeah. And they just kind of never went away, really. Um, 
the media. So in terms of the media paying attention to you, I'm assuming that it's not, well, I'm hoping it's not harassment, that it's um, you're a public figure who has advocated, but maybe that isn't the case. Well, actually, I so let me let me backtrack a couple bit a little bit here. So yeah. when the media descended on Laramie, yeah, um, there was a a, a a media consultant from Glad, Kathy mm-hmm. Renna, yeah, who just like was brilliant and was talking to all the journalists. This is your language. This is how you talk about it. Mm. This is how the right words. This is the right. This is the right way you do it. And bless your heart, they paid attention. Um, they did not harass us. A couple of reasons: we didn't have a residence in the states. Yeah, they couldn't like park in a front yard. They didn't know what we looked like until the day of Matt's funeral. Wow. Yeah. Um, they never really, and I was really careful about um, giving out contact information. I mean, it was hard to find me mm-hmm. in the beginning. Yeah. It was all done through the hospital or the church. So any of those media requests were like second or third hand. Yeah. So they didn't harass us. They harassed other people, Mm -hmm. but they didn't harass us. And then later when I started doing, I did a few interviews in 99. We had asked to not, you know, keep that high a profile until the trials were over. Yeah. We attempted to do that. Mm -hmm. Um. But I also learned that the media can actually, you know, I figured out pretty soon that what they wanted to hear from us, they were going to use our story to sell their newspapers, not just share information. But I could use them as well. <laughs> I, could, I could tell the story of all the things benign the community, yeah. all the really horrific things that were happening and the things that should have been happening that were not happening. Yeah. And, you know, I could use that time to, you know, inform people about other yeah. things than just Matt. Wow. So, Amazing. So that's what we did. So I have a question. So you're an introvert who likes to be alone, and then suddenly you're in the spotlight speaking all over. How did you cultivate the skills to do this? I really didn't. Um, I talked to a lot of people. I actually went on a lecture circuit with colleges and stuff with a speaker's bureau just because yeah. I wanted people to, I wanted them to know things. I yeah. wasn't sure. I thought a couple of years and people are going to forget about us. <laughs> I didn't. I don't I, think so. I had no clue, you know, how yeah. it was actually going to play out. And um, I just wanted them to know things. And then I thought in colleges, if they could see that I was doing okay, mm-hmm. that, they would take up the mantle. Yes. I could yes. get them to do things that they yeah. wanted to do. And I could give, maybe give them the courage to do it mm-hmm. or at least the will to do it in their own way. Yes. Um, I was pretty pissed off to be mm-hmm. honest. And uh, I think that anger and helplessness mm-hmm. just drove me to do whatever I felt I could do. And when I, earlier I said, I talked to other people who did, speaking and they yeah. had all these ideas like oh i draw a venn diagram with notes and then i look at it to figure out what i've left out it's like mm-hmm. i can't do that i can't i can't i can't look at my notes and then talk to people they don't come to see me read yeah right yeah. so i'm just going to talk and yeah no no talk i've ever given has been the same mm-hmm. questions at the end are always the same but uh, yeah. my talk is never the same yeah. I try to make it as local as I can. Yes. Wonderful. Right? To, to where location I am, whether it's a business or a school. Yeah. I don't know. By education, I'm a teacher. Maybe that came into play. Mm-hmm. Not sure. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also knew that it, I just had to be me. I couldn't be yeah. anything else. We had a media consultant for a minute who was like, you need to stick to these bullet points. And when they ask a question that's not on these bullet points, you need to direct them back around. It's like, I can't do that either. If they ask me a question, I'm going to answer the question because that's just who I am. And well, that's amazing. And that's, in a sense, why you're here tonight and probably why we're all enjoying you. Um, I don't know how many people ask you this, but you're a woman that most people see and probably break into tears. Um, how do you handle that? Yeah. Um, 
Well, it depends on the day, really. Uh, either I break into tears too, or um, Dennis and I are both just really honored that people want to share their stories with us. It's just yes. a, it's such a trust factor, yes. right? Yeah. But we've been doing that since the day of Matt's funeral. I mean, that's mm -hmm. what we did at Matt's funeral. Wow. And it was a realization of like, oh, this is our role yeah. from now on. We'll be comforting Wonderful. people. Yeah. They, nobody will be comforting us. Mm -hmm. So um, it's just what we've always done. And I, I get it. I totally get it. They, if they follow the story from beginning to end, it's impactful to them. And it's important. And I get that. It's fine. I welcome it. Well, I don't, we don't recognize that often. You're, you're a strong woman. I was watching you. I don't know what year it was. You went on the Ellen show and she started crying and you comforted her and then she comforted you. And it was so touching. And then you went on and gave this incredible speech. So there you go. Well, it was. That's right. That's right. When my book came out, right. 2009, yeah. I think. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, my book came out before the, all the really good stuff happened in the Obama administration, but um, yeah, it was, I don't know. I, I never really thought of myself as being opinionated, but apparently I am. So. <laughs> you learned something about yourself. Um, do you want to share some powerful moments that you had with Matt when he was young, that maybe at the moment didn't even seem that powerful? Oh, you're asking a lot. You know how old I am now? That's like so long ago. <laughs> um, you don't have to answer it, but um, you don't look that old. You know, there was, oh, you're very kind. Um, <laughs> there was a couple things about Matt that were really special. And maybe all, maybe all mothers feel them, but he was very interested in the theater at a very young age and wanted to join the community theater. He was 10. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so his dad called and said, my son wants to come down and audition. And, you know, they said, how old is he? And Dennis told him and they said, you know, we've not really had good luck with kids that young. And Dennis goes, you've not met Matt. So, <laughs> <laughs> so he went and they welcomed him and they were, he was, he was the lead in a couple of their plays. He was part of the Casper College productions. He just loved it. Mm -hmm. um, he thought he could sing and dance, but he couldn't do that. Um, <laughs> Meaning talent-wise or? Oh, no, he talent-wise. He just had no sense of rhythm. Okay, yeah. Blonde-haired, blue-eyed, white boy, and um, couldn't sing either, followed after both his parents in that direction. So, but he just, he just loved the theater. He loved the people that were there. He loved the community. Um, the idea that you could you know, be somebody else for a while. Yeah. Just what every actor says, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't think he had any illusions it was going to be a career, but he he loved mm -hmm. being a part of it. Mm -hmm. Uh you know, Halloween and elementary school. Remember the days when you used to dress up for school and Halloween? Yeah. I don't know if they do that anymore. He yeah. was Dolly Parton for three years. <laughs> he was just brilliant at, you know, making up, finding other correct body proportion thing to make that work yeah um we got better every year his teachers loved it he just mm -hmm. he, he just he thought it was so fun to be well i mean seriously dolly is like she's everything about somebody who wants to impersonate you right <laughs> big personalities distinctive looks um yeah voice yes. amazing personality yeah. um are there moments either that you miss or regrets for what you haven't said? Well, we've been doing this a long time. So yeah. in the beginning, we made conscious decision about things we would share and not share. Yeah. Things we just needed to keep for ourselves. Sure. Yeah. Um, what I miss are his hugs. He was an amazing hug giver like to give them and get them and mm -hmm. conversation is a wonderful conversationalist mm -hmm. really really good good yeah. listener um smart uh loved current events and the news and he was just i miss that mm -hmm. i miss that banter and his smiles and hugs and yeah thank you for being so candid and i know i'm asking different questions than some people may ask and it's so important 
for people, for family, for friends and loved ones to hear the real story. Um, I was thinking about the notion of resilience and resilience is being able to face adversity and then do something with it. And I recently was at a seminar and the presenter said that 75% of people who experience trauma are able to do something with resiliency, which is a pretty high number. And when I think about you, you're one of those people and you've you've turned this into something big and maybe you feel like you had no choice, but we're all benefiting as a result. But I'd love you to talk about the trajectory of the Matthew Shepard organization and, and what took place and what you're working on now. I love to do that. Um, but first I want to address what you said about resiliency. Yeah. In this particular arena of families who've lost their children because they happen to be gay. Yeah. You have to also have parents that are okay with their kids being gay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's not, that's not all of them. That's right. There's more now, definitely. And um, the advantage that Dennis and I had was in getting our message out was not just the media was interested, but the, the organizations, all the national organizations were ready to have, they were on the cusp of being really, really impactful. Yeah, yeah. And Matt Sturry just sort of not just woke up members of the community, maybe it was a final straw, but it woke up so many in the straight community mm -hmm. because it was in mainstream mm -hmm. media. Yeah. So we were, we had an advantage in that People wanted to talk to us. It wasn't us searching out them, right? Which yeah. a lot of folks in terms of something trauma mm -hmm. isn't always the case. And yeah. we got a lot of inquiries, not so much anymore, but in the beginning, how do you get the media to pay attention to you? And it's like, well, first off, we didn't want that to start with. Correct. They didn't want that. Yeah. And um, we didn't ask for it. It just happened, but you can't mm -hmm. make the media pay attention to what they don't want to pay attention to. Yeah. Yeah. Can't. Okay, so the foundation. So um, earlier I said we've gotten so many messages from folks wanting us to do something. Yeah. But they also sent money mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, to pay the hospital bill, whatever. And we didn't know what to do with that money. We didn't want to use it for the hospital. That just seemed not right. Um, so we thought, well, we'll take this ready and we will start a nonprofit. And we can help, you know, other young people do stuff. I don't know what that meant, mm -hmm. <laughs> really. We can either, you know, give money to organizations that are working with young people or we can whatever. But we had to get established first and the IRS, bless them. We see you have money. That's great. Now, what's your idea? Well, I don't <laughs> know. I don't know. Um, so we said, well, we're just going to, we're going to do youth advocacy. And I really had no idea what that was going to be, but I honestly didn't think we'd last more than a couple of years. Wow. Interesting. So, you know, we, we could have granted that money out. We did start a scholarship. Mm -hmm. uh, Elton John actually started a scholarship at the University of Wyoming uh, in his name for Matt. Um, and, but every, from then on, every sense of oppression or hate crime or sometimes just violence, Matt's name would come up in the press. Yes. Yeah. Even stories about Afghani women in mm -hmm. the early 2000s, and Matt's name would be referenced wow. to matter. Mm -hmm. um, so we persevered, and our mission, we've stayed small because I was desperate to not get so big, mm -hmm. I couldn't keep yeah. everybody employed, right? Yeah. It was a sustain, it had to be sustainable. Yeah. So we've never had more than nine people working for us. Now we have six, I think. Wow. Um, all very good at their job. And they, they don't like have assistance. They do the work. Mm -hmm. So um, we've done hate crime training. Uh, we've done, uh, we've done um, uh, FBI conferences. Mm -hmm. We've done employee resource groups. Yeah. Talking about allyship. Yeah. Um, 
hate crime laws, things being denied the gay community, like job protections, mm -hmm. um, this honeycomb of laws for the community nationwide, like adoption and families and health care, and this mess of trans anti-trans legislation. Um, there's just m never a lack of things to talk about. That is true. So uh, we don't, we, our mission is to keep Matt's legacy alive, yeah. to keep the story alive, to tell the story. Yeah. Um, and pretty much we'll just be whatever you need us to be. Well, um, I see no sign of you slowing down, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, and your voice is badly needed and thank God you're out there. Thank you. Yeah. We really thought in 2016, <clears throat> the other person won the election that we'd really be in a good place right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, quite frankly, even in 2000, if the right person had been given the election the way he should have been, we'd be on a much different trajectory. And um, we considered we might be able to just, you know, downsize and just be Matt's legacy and that's it. Mm -hmm. But that surely didn't happen after 2016. We just took so many steps back. Yes. And, uh, I don't know how we got to this hateful presence present once again, but it's not just the U S it's worldwide now. So it's such an odd time. I don't know if you were here or not. When I was saying on one hand, LGBTQ acceptance is on the rise and it's more visible and it's in media and on television. And then on the other hand, hate crimes are on the rise and people are not feeling safe. And I, I know you're speaking about this when you're giving talks. It's just such an odd juxtaposition. It is odd, but it's, you know, you, I just, I know that when the numbers show that acceptance is on the rise, it's because it's the majority. It's the very vocal, hateful, ignorant minority that is causing all the problems and not just for the gay community, all right. of the marginalized communities, yeah. API. Uh, the Jewish community, black community, everybody. Yeah. Everybody that's not a straight white Christian male mm -hmm. um, yeah. is just facing much more challenging times right now since 2016. Yeah. Wow. Well, yeah. Do you mind if I ask you a couple questions about your own process with grief? Sure. Go ahead. I mean, not, you know yeah, I mean, I don't even know what my question is. There's no timeline to it, but... How, do, how did you get through it? How do you get through it? You've mentioned it's 25 years and it probably feels like yesterday. Um, can you just talk about the process and the pain and the joy and all that you've experienced along the way? Well, when, when, I, when I said earlier that uh, Dennis had to go back to work and our other son had to go back to school and I was by myself. Yeah. I think one of the hidden blessings is we all grieved in our own way. Mm -hmm. I never really thought that that would be a good thing, but I think that I reflect it was because we didn't have to explain ourselves to each other. Yeah. And um, for me, going and going in a lecture circuit, I could tell the same story about Matt over and over and over. And nobody said, Judy, I've heard that story a thousand times. Hmm. I could just keep telling it. And and my favorite stories about Matt and Matt would always be with me. I never knew what I was going to say when I got to the podium. Yeah. But somehow I knew what to say when I got there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I always felt like he was with me. Wonderful. And that's just how we, we've we kept him with us. Yeah. Wonderful. We also understand there's no timeline to it, right? right? Correct. Uh, yeah. It never ends. It gets different. But... It never ends. It never. 25 years uh, in some ways brings it up again. It's such a big number. Yeah. 2018 was a big year too because we had the cathedral and the Smithsonian and 20 years. This year will be big. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and okay. will you do something public or something private? We've never done anything public to commemorate except for our own gala in October. Yeah. Um, I've never felt like that was necessary mm -hmm. for us to do that. Yeah. Honestly, it felt a little too big, really. Um, we have a gala every in October, and that's sort of our commemoration. And um, in Denver, uh, every year, this will be bigger. Mm-hmm. 
Um, but nothing, you know, nothing. And also at the cathedral on his birthday, December 1st, there yeah. was something again. No. But that's all the things we have planned. I think that you're doing more for other people than they may be doing for you, or maybe it goes in both directions. But, you know, hearing his name evokes such pain for all of us and, and we need help ourselves and you're a model for us. And again, when I watched you on Ellen, for example, it was like, okay, she can hold her own. And there was some strength and relief in watching that. Yeah. I, our whole goal from the beginning has been, we have to just get people to use their voices. It's the most powerful tool against yeah. hate. Yeah. And you don't have to be part of an organization to do that. One single voice can do so much, yeah. even if it's just your neighbors and your family. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, that's where we need to start. And we just need to keep doing it because this minority is so loud in their hate. Mm -hmm. And um, I know that's not the majority. I know it's not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so grateful that you were willing to speak with us. We're a small group and here you are giving your time and spreading the word and highlighting all of us. So thank you so much. I'm going to run through questions that people have been asking. Great. Um, Again, I'm so sorry. I messed up the time. I was totally you're worth the wait. Not a problem. I was a little nervous, but we got through it. Um, one person says, I get chills and emotional every time I hear Matt's story. And I can tell you that's way more than one person. Um, someone thanking me, um, someone saying what an honor it is to have you here. It's wonderful to hear about Matt's life since we almost only hear about his death. Thank you for sharing your story and for sharing and bringing him to life. Thanks. Um, what has all the attention been like for Matthew's brother and how has life been for him? Um, well, Matt's brother is much like his mom, very much an introvert, never be the public face of the organization ever. Mm -hmm. Works there for us and has for years, um, but never he'll never be the public face. He was for like a minute. Mm -hmm. And he was on the employee roster and on the website and yada, yada. But he would get calls that were very odd and um, made him very uncomfortable. So he's not not there anymore. And, um, you know, people can be sort of unthinkingly unkind sometimes. One gentleman called in and said, you know, we, we'd really like to see pictures of Matt smiling. But we just see pensive or whatever, more pictures of Matt smiling. And Logan and all his wit goes, well, Matt's dead. So <laughs> there won't be any new pictures. <laughs> and, and he called me and said, uh, take me off. I'm not answering <laughs> anymore. <laughs> um, but he's very much an advocate. His fiance um, is also very much an advocate. She's wonderful. Very much an extrovert, mm -hmm. like Dennis. Yeah. Um, I guess, you know, opposites do attract. And um, he's been really good. I watch for anything that might pop up all these years later. You know, you never know, right? Yeah. Uh, I watch. Yeah. He's he's good. He's really good. Um, and he's, he's, he's doing really well. And for anybody who really is interested in who Matt was as a person, there's a wonderful documentary about him called Matt Shepard is a friend of mine mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. you can stream, done by a friend of his from high school, oh. won an Emmy for mm -hmm. it, and um, is told from the viewpoint of his friends, not his family. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's really wonderful. It talks about who Matt was, but it also goes through the end. Mm -hmm. And so it's hard, it's hard to watch. Mm -hmm. But it's really, if you want to get to know Matt, that's how you do it. And say the name of the, game, of the movie one more time. Matt Shepard is a friend of mine. Thank you. Um, I'd love to know what you and your self-care practices are in order to protect yourself, your energy, your family, while also being a public figure? Self-care, well, I'm an introvert, so right there, you know I'm good at self-care. Um, <laughs> for a while, pre-pandemic, I had a Mahjong group. Uh, when I wasn't traveling, I had three girlfriends and we'd come over and play Mahjong, um, and Dennis would watch basketball or whatever. Um, Post-pandemic, it's been harder to get them back together. Yeah. 
um, actually, I sort of love not being able to go anywhere for those two years. <laughs> I can um, relate. <laughs> yeah, so, um, and also I thought I would never do these kinds of things because mm -hmm. I always felt like I was a talking pumpkin. I've gotten used to it now. Yeah. So um, they're kind of fun. I get to talk to more people now. Than... And you don't have to travel far to do it. That's nice. I don't have to be on an airplane all the time anymore. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, so I'm good at self-care because I'm an introvert. I, yeah. I know how to do that and I've always known how to do that. That's, that is not a worry. Well, if you were my next door neighbor, I'd make you go for dog walks with me and we could be <laughs> alone, but uh, together. <laughs> um. I'd be interested in knowing whether in the wake of Matthew's death, you were ever haunted by the what if questions. If you ever wondered if you could have done anything differently. Of course. You know, we, you always do that. And I'm not sure you ever get away from it. What's, what's the point? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can't go back. Yeah. You can't change anything. Mm -hmm. And who's to say if any of those what ifs would have changed anything, really? Mm -hmm. um, even if we'd lived in the same town. Would he have done anything differently? No, right. he wouldn't. So it's a, it's a waste of energy and time and I refuse to dwell there. Um, I, I, I need to spend my energy someplace else. Yeah. But of course those questions come up. They, of course they do, always do, especially in the beginning. Yeah. Because um, you, you have this sense of guilt that if I'd just been there, but realistically, even if we'd been there, nothing would be different. Correct. Uh, about that night. Now, through his whole life, I don't know. Um, but is it, does, doesn't every parent ask that question? Yeah, and I've spoken to a lot of parents and heard a lot of stories and what you're sharing with us about supporting him is pretty incredible. So he was lucky. I just had, maybe you can help me with this. I just had a question about that. So I knew it wasn't going to be a thing. And when Matt finally did have the opportunity to tell Dennis in person, mm -hmm. he, he, the just, the just so it is Matt told Dennis and Dennis goes, well, cool. It's late. Can we go to bed now? And in retrospect, I'm thinking we gave no power to his angst. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering now if that was the wrong thing to do. Well, I have two reactions. One is it may have been a huge sense of relief that it was handled so casually and most children feel that way. Um, if Matt was the kind of guy who needed power to his angst, would he have let you know that at the time? That's, that's an excellent response. I don't know. Dennis certainly feels like he was relieved to know that there wasn't gonna be a, however, remember that Matt loved the theater. So I think he built up this. Yeah you know, yeah. reaction in his head. And when it didn't happen, that was relief. But and uh, I didn't have enough time to really ask him. Honestly. That's right. Most, most children fear a horrible, painful, negative response from their parents. Yeah. And most children would prefer a neutral response. Thank you for that. Yeah, I appreciate it. absolutely. Um, there's a lot of LGBTQIA violence. What do you think this particular incident captured? Why do you think this particular incident captured the attention of the country? Yeah, million dollar question. Yeah. Um, well, remember the time was late 1998. We were in the throes of Bill and Monica. Maybe the press was tired of Bill and Monica. I, I don't know. I just remember being awfully devastated at the time. And I think it was a wake up call. Yeah. Also, Matt was blue haired, blue eyed, blonde haired. He'd have been a person of color. Mm -hmm. Would it have been yeah. the same story? Right. Probably not. Right. Iconic location. Uh, horrific violence. Mm -hmm. Brutalization was terrible. And yeah. Matt was found alive. Yeah. yeah. If he'd been found already gone, I don't know that the story would have mattered as much but people were praying for him and hoping wow. for his recovery and you know it was on the news every night and um just because he was still with us so I, a lot of things played into that i think i i think that makes sense but i still think the story would have been profound i mean it changed it changed our history it did yeah um, if the shepherd family can transform their loss into a movement do you think it's possible for others to transform pain 
into social change. Oh, sure. Absolutely. The Bird family did that um, in the beginning. And, you know, it's, it's you, you just have to find your people. And it may not be the one that becomes national or international or even as big as you'd like it to be. But as I said earlier, one voice mm -hmm. makes a big difference. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for sharing and your authenticity, your authenticity comes through well worth the wait. Um, Judy, you mentioned that people often ask you the same questions after you speak. What are some of the questions that people ask? Probably everyone I asked tonight, but that's true. If they are, but it's because those are the questions people want the answers to. I get it. I, I totally get it. Yeah. Um, and occasionally I get a question I've never had before and like that will make me cry. Um, uh, but it's the same things everyone of course would wanna know. Just, um, I do get the one question you haven't asked is, have I forgiven them? Hmm. Um, the two young men and the yeah. answer is they haven't asked. So no, I don't regard it as part of my process. I don't carry that hate around with me. I'm angry, but I'm angry at the system at the system just as much as I am at them. Yeah. Um, but they haven't, you know, expressed remorse or asked for forgiveness or any of that. So no. And mm. and why would I? I don't I don't find it necessary to be part of my process really. They're just gone. Well it strikes me that again in your own resiliency, you're giving back and you're doing what you need to do with your grief instead of holding on to a grudge and focusing in on that and we all luck out as a result. Well, you know, you hear from everybody that hate just eats you up from the inside out, yeah. which explains hate violence, right? Mm -hmm. They're experiencing that. And, yeah. and I just never did. We, yep. we just don't. Yeah, great. Um, it's an inspiration as a PFLAG mom to see the advocacy that okay. you do. Thank you for that. Um, what can we do to help continue the mission of acceptance? I'm worried about the change that started in 2016. Yeah, you got to vote. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. you got to vote. Yeah. Um, when I talk about that and my when I would when we talk, it's like we need to really we need to be educated voters and we need to actually vote. We need to listen to what they say, pay attention to their past. Um, don't spend so much time thinking about which party they represent. And you also really can't be a single issue voter. That it depends on your issue, in my view, also. Mm -hmm. In the past, the gay community is like, why would I vote? Nobody there supporting me. Well, y'all got to get over that because <laughs> now there are people supporting you. Yeah. And we need to get them in office, but you need yes. to be, you need to pay attention to what's happening. Mm -hmm. And then everybody says, oh, yeah, out, vote everybody in the House of Representatives out, but I like my guy. Well, if everybody says that, nothing changes. Mm -hmm. I mean, Look at the debacle at the House electing McCarthy. What a travesty. Yeah. Um, embarrassing. It's horrific. And y'all just got to, y'all really got to vote. Mm -hmm. and you got to run for office yourself. And you got to be a part of the campaign. And you have to participate in the process. Mm -hmm. And campaign to get civics back in your schools. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good answer. Go school board meetings. Run for the school board. Yeah. You gotta get those folks out of there. Stop banning books. Pay attention to your teachers. Oh my God, I could go on forever. <laughs> There's just so much we could do and we're just sort of hesitant to do it because we don't want that hate to come to us, but we have to make a decision. Thank you. Yeah. Let's see, Judy, you mentioned the people often. Okay, I think I asked that. Um, someone told me I'm an amazing therapist. Thank you. Um, that's what I do during the day, by the way. Oh, great. Um, <laughs> I asked the right person my question. Yeah, you did. Yeah. I thought maybe she knew. Um, I remember rocking my newborn son, watching this story on the news, and it hurt me so much as a young mom. I cried. I, it's hard for me to read it. I cried for hours. Little did I know that the little baby boy in my arms was gay. For whatever it's worth, I held that baby tighter and wanted to stay close to him. When he came out as 17, I remembered this story and I was scared. I didn't want anyone to hurt him. I always remembered this story and how strong you seemed. 
thank you for keeping Matthew's memory alive. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. You know, we got, uh, uh, we got a lot of those um, kinds of cards when Matt passed. Like, yeah. I'm never going to raise, I'm going to raise my kid right, right? Mm -hmm. um, I want to ask them now, did you do that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you yeah. make sure that they were implicit? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. In the darkest moments of grief, where do you find strength? Hmm. My family, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, in my darkest moments of grief also, I know that there's a million kids out there looking for something. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's where it is. Okay. Mm -hmm. If we ever thought we were gonna quit doing this, um, actually, we're old now, so it may not be too long before we have to. Um, but the idea that we would do it while there's still work to be done is hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you, you're not going anywhere anytime soon because we need you and your voice makes a difference. And part of what makes you incredible is that you're a real person and you're sharing a real story and you're speaking to small groups and large groups and um, you're authentic. And I think, like you said, one story makes all the difference and your story is going out and going out and going out from a place of real. So we thank you for that. Thank you. Um, I think we, we are good. There's just many positive hearts and thank yous. And again, from the bottom of my heart, Judy, thank you so much for being here. This has been a beautiful evening. I hope we get to meet in person someday. Thank you. Thank and you. I don't know if there's any final comments or advice or suggestions for moms or family members or friends out there or allies. I don't find a comment which is Remember to vote and use your voice. Tell your stories. Put your pictures of your gay kids and your straight kids together. And they're your everybody's your family. The more right. people know how many gay folks are out there. One of my one of my college stories was if everybody would wear the same color one day, allies, members of the community, the world would see how many of us there really are. Mm, and that would be love that. that would be life-changing. Yeah. Um and I met someone who was at that lecture and she said, that's the only thing she remembers. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. That's really, the, that's really the fun part of doing this so long, right? You meet the people that were there Yeah. 20 years later. Um, right. That's really fun. Then, so I, I appreciate the invitation. Once again, I apologize for not, not being a problem. Time. You, you, you um, didn't make me look so good at the beginning, but I held my own and I made it. <laughs> I'm so, so sorry. It doesn't um, matter. It was great. And again, um, your organization is at matthewshepherd.org. Yes. And my organization is gaysonsandmothers.org. And thank you, everyone, for being here. And thank you, yes, thank you. Shepherd. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. Sorry, y'all. Good night. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Oh, bye.